We're destroying the world. Of course, throughout my life, the United States has um, pretty consistently been at wars. Uh, the wars that we see around the world are either directly or indirectly fueled by the United States. I learned that violence is intoxicating. I've seen people when they kill in orgies of violence. If there's life after death, or if there's different dimensions, then he knows everything. So I would just probably just give him a hug and not let go. When he was first killed, I used to come almost every day. And when I come, I like to bring like seasonal flowers, just de decorate for, for different seasons and stuff like that. His dad comes every year on Memorial Day, but I, I don't come because I don't like to glorify war uh, using his death. Cindy Sheenan's son, Casey, was a soldier in the US Army. He died in 2004 after being deployed to Iraq. He died before he turned 25. Since the start of the 20th century, the United States has been a dominant force in the world. Yet its prosperity has come at a cost, not least for its own people. Voices of protest have emanated from within as the nation grapples with the complex effects and consequences of decades of war. We're here to tell him we need peace. He needs to call on Biden to go to the negotiating table. Do it. Do it. Let them fail. You're failing right now. I was here 21 years ago and they didn't listen and six million people are dead because of the war in Iraq. We have to listen, war kills. Jody Evans is an American anti-war activist. Throughout her life, she has been steadfast in her efforts to win people's hearts and advocate for peace. She co-founded the anti-war organization Code Pink with a group of like-minded women around two decades ago. They use pink as their signature color. I started uh, in the late 60s, early 70s as an anti-war activist. It was during the Vietnam War and brothers, older brothers of my friends in high school were dying and coming home in body bags. And they were 18, 19, 20 years old. So my first activism was really to try to stop the war. We're shipping out orders for us. Lovely supporters. Um, I was looking, we don't have a lot of large left, right? We have a lot in the iHeart house. Oh, we do. Yes, we're okay. This weekend, Code Pink has organized a demonstration in support of the Palestinian people. Their slogan is Ceasefire, Free Palestine. Anti-war demonstrations like those organized by Code Pink have regularly arisen in the US in response to the nation deploying troops around the world. The 9-11 terrorist attacks took place on September 2001. Within a month, the US and its allies had invaded Afghanistan to punish those responsible. Yet their attempts to target Al-Qaeda and the Taliban resulted in many civilian casualties. Later, in 2003,
the US faced scrutiny from the international community over its plan to invade Iraq based on claims that the nation had weapons of mass destruction. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. I know that the U.S. government's crazy, I've, you know, but I felt that um, what happens in the fog of war is I wanted to be in front of that and say, no, this is wrong. The nexus of Iraq and terror is old. The combination is lethal. When we confront a regime that harbors ambitions for regional domination, hides weapons of mass destruction, and provides haven and active support for terrorists, and unless we act, we are confronting an even more frightening future. And while we listen to the lies from Colin Powell, everyone from around the world and in that room knew they were lies. Innocent, fully innocent people who had done nothing. There was no Iraqi pilot on any of those planes in 9-11. They were Saudi. Iraq is a, a secular country. Which one of the things was to talk about? We ordered balloons, so we're going to see the proofs to see if they look good this week. Um, Jody strives every day to make the world aware of the US government's continuing role in wars overseas, either through public events or sharing online. She calls herself a citizen and he diplomat. Just keeps getting away with murder, and the US keeps getting away with murder. Code Pink started when Bush was frightening the American people into war on an innocent country, Iraq. And he was using these color-coded alerts of orange, red, and yellow. Oh my God, it's red today. You should all be afraid. We're protecting you when you know nothing was happening. Um, and this is right after 9-11, so the people in the United States were afraid. And so we called Code Pink for peace. Jody's use of bright pink symbolizes compassion as well as a woman's profound understanding of war and peace. It represents the mothers of those who stand and fall on the battlefield. 9-11 was the catalyst that also changed the destiny of Cindy's family. Her son Casey enlisted in the US Army in May 2000. They told Casey he could have a laptop in the military to go to college. They told Casey he could take classes while he was, like physical classes while he was in the military. And plus, they told him that he would never see combat. Like most recruits, Casey joined the army seeking a life of adventure. He could not have foreseen that he'd one day be sent to the front lines in Iraq. his old flowers on a grave that doesn't have flowers. <laughs> this is a symbol for being an Eagle Scout for the Boy Scouts of America. This is his favorite band, Van Halen. This he liked World Wrestling Federation. You know, the fake wrestling. He loved that. And his favorite superhero was Superman. Casey is among the many sons and daughters whose lives have been cut short by the US's involvement in conflict. Why did the US choose to send its troops to the Middle East, bringing devastation to both the local inhabitants and its own people? To find the answer to that question, 
we must look back to the 1980s and 90s. Is it because the Iraqis had withdrawn after the Gulf War below the 38th parallel, so we were uncovering these huge mass graves. There were 1,500 people. We went into their torture centers. We saw the videos of the executions, and I was putting this on the front page of the New York Times. So Saddam put out put a price on my head. I'm a former foreign correspondent for the New York Times. I was overseas for 20 years. I spent five years reporting on the conflicts in Central America in the early 1980s. I spent seven years in the Middle East, uh, much of that time on the Palestine-Israel conflict. I also covered the first Gulf War. In 1991, a US-led coalition launched an attack on Iraq following its invasion of neighboring Kuwait. The aerial bombing campaign killed up to 3,500 civilians and destroyed 9,000 homes. After the war, shortages of food and medicine, as well as the critical damage to infrastructure, resulted in a further 100,000 to 200,000 civilian deaths according to estimates. The public health catastrophe brought by the war and subsequent international sanctions led to the deaths of around 500,000 children. Well, having spent 20 years on the outer reaches of empire, uh, I'm acutely aware of the crimes of empire. I'm talking about the American empire as well as their proxies. Packer was like on the whole invasion of Iraq. He was constantly, publicly attacking me. Mm -hmm. And then for, when all goes bad, he writes Assassin's Gate. Very hard to come back to the United States after two decades uh, and not work as hard as I can to make other Americans aware of what is happening, what the empire is doing, uh, the whole nature of permanent war uh, and what its consequences are. So Journalists like Chris Hedges have witnessed firsthand the ordeals ordinary people must endure in wartime. Like others, he is committed to revealing to his fellow countrymen the true costs of his nation's complex role in the conflicts of recent decades. Found that 66% of likely voters strongly or somewhat agree that the US should call for a ceasefire, a percentage that rises to 80% among Democrats. Joining me to discuss the grassroots effort to impose a ceasefire is Medea Benjamin, a co-founder of the feminist anti-war group Code Pink. And now we're seeing the call for uh, another tranche, enormous tranche of money, $104 billion uh, that the administration is asking for uh, that is just uh, mana for these uh, weapons companies. The wars that the U.S. instigate overseas are often painted by its government as humanitarian interventions. Yet critics argue that these interventions often have led only to humanitarian disasters. The U.N. inspection teams went in to Iraq and, and Saddam Hussein did have chemical agents stored in artillery shells, but they destroyed those stockpiles. The military he didn't have spare parts for his tanks. He, it, he was a joke. He wasn't a threat to Kuwait or us or anyone else. But the neocons or these ideologues wanted to take over Iraq. Obviously, it has a lot of oil. Uh, and they thought they were going to reshape the Middle East. Many US citizens traveling abroad have discovered a distinct change in attitudes towards their country due to its military activities around the globe and its unilateral America first mentality. I use the Swiss passport in Iran. And also in Gaza, I would use my Swiss passport. It's just easier than being an American in some places. Well, the problem is that the, the United States, really, its diplomatic service has been rendered uh, impotent in the sense that, you know, even when I was overseas, the embassy was controlled by the military and the CIA. And the ambassador often didn't even know what they were doing. The scars of war run deep. While the devastating wounds caused to buildings and neighborhoods are clearly visible to the naked eye, 
the long-term effects can be much harder to identify. And although the conflicts involving the US have been fought on foreign soil, the American people are never immune from the impacts of the humanitarian crises that ensue. In the modern world, the United States stands as a symbol of wealth and prosperity. Yet its development has been widely unbalanced. According to the US Federal Reserve, the country's central bank, the richest 1% of the population owns almost one third of the wealth. And essentially you have created a system whereby the uh, corporations, the sole objective of government is to increase the power and profits of corporations, then you've built a kind of predatory capitalism, which is what we have, and the, the worst social inequality in American history. Uh, so our billionaire class is unlike a billionaire class of the past, a hundred people like Musk, and these people are worth $180 billion. For many ordinary Americans, the increased cost of living is making life harder than ever. They are seeing massive expenditures go into making weapons, sending weapons, uh, building up the military apparatus while their working conditions, their health care, their living conditions continue to worsen or get farther and farther out of reach. They're finding themselves in more and more debt, unable to afford housing. We see a homelessness crisis in the United States. Despite cities and communities nationwide crying out for investment in renewal programs, military spending continues to carve out an increasing proportion of the US government's budget. Remember this, in the 13 wars we've started over the last 30 years, and the $14 trillion we've spent, and the hundreds of thousands of lives that have perished from this earth, remember that it wasn't one leader, but a system, both Republican and Democrat. And call it what you will, the military, industrial, security, money, media, complex, it's a system that has been perpetuated the better, that has been perpetuated under the guise that these are just wars justifiable in the name of our flag that flies so proudly over our lives. Our country has become more prosperous for many, but in the name of that wealth, we cannot justify our system as a center for the world's values, when we continue to create such war and chaos in the world. Public transportation is a wreck. Our cities are decaying and our infrastructure is collapsing. Uh, and that's because uh, we divert 50% uh, of all discretionary spending towards a war industry that is unchecked, uncontrolled, and unregulated. Uh, and that is a symptom of late empire. But that's where we are. And of course, the Achilles heel of the American empire is the uh, dollar as the world's reserve currency. So uh, once that's gone, and we know what happened when the pound sterling uh, was removed as the world's reserve currency in the 1950s, then the American economy goes into a tailspin. Nobody wants to buy our debt. Um, the empire becomes really essentially unaffordable. It's too expensive. The impact of war is not limited to the loss of lives. It can also result in economic decline, low employment, and market slumps. Combined, these can perpetuate a vicious cycle. Because the US capitalist economy really runs on war. If it wasn't for this war, it would fall apart the next day. There would be no US economy. Exactly who benefits from the U.S. deploying troops around the world? 
the reason we fought that war was not to uphold UN mandates. It was not to uh, prove that the new world order was going to be established well by George Herbert Walker Bush. It was to protect oil. History shows that international wars have often coincided with domestic crises in the US. Naturally, this has led to speculation on whether the country has had possible hidden motives when entering some conflicts, such as a thirst for resources. Because what war does is, one, it allows for the usurpation of the vast natural wealth that exists all around the world. The US can essentially lay claim and lay dominance over very key strategic sectors. I mean, the, the broad knowledge about why the United States is involved in the Middle East is largely because many countries there, whether it's Syria, where the US actually just steals Syrian oil uh, in its occupation of 30% of the northeast of the country, this is why the United States does it. It's to help these monopolies continue to generate profits. As the price of oil is pegged to the dollar, controlling reserves in the Middle East allows the US to dominate the global energy landscape while preserving its currency's supremacy. The war in Vietnam that lasted from the 1950s until the 70s inflicted untold death and destruction on the Vietnamese people. The conflict, the longest and most brutal since World War II, remains a painful memory for many Americans. If it wasn't for the US's invasion of Vietnam, I probably wouldn't have been born. My father was drafted uh, during the period of Richard Nixon's so-called Vietnamization. He described it as an absolute massacre. It Danny Haifong's mother was Vietnamese. She left her country in the turbulence of the 70s and moved to the US. Today, Danny is a socialist activist, writer, and political analyst. In the past decade, he has published articles and openly criticized the US for its record of human rights abuses and war crimes around the world. I was there. You know, they basically are very enthusiastic about it. But you know, the unfortunate thing is, wars are ugly, okay? That's a given. Young men go off to fight, and some of them die. And the ones that don't die come back to the United States and eventually become old men with memories we just assume not have. The airplane was so close to me and so loud. That explosion happened right behind me. Then suddenly the fire everywhere around me and I didn't see anyone but the fire. My clothes burned off and then my body on fire. And I was so scared. I ran out and kept running and running and running. I'm naked and agony. I have to accept that that picture is a really powerful. I became a victim of war. The whole policy of trying to end the Vietnam War was an attempt to pull back direct U.S. military forces and support forces inside of Vietnam called Vietnamization in order to maintain control. It failed stupendously because the Vietnamese people primarily and principally wanted no part of it. I think I see it more clearly today than I did then. I think we were wrong. I think maybe the biggest reason is to maintain and expand U.S. dominance generally. 
but it's corporate dominance, you need political, do like the United States needs political domination and military uh, prowess in order to maintain economic hegemony. The US military industrial complex makes a massive contribution to the domestic economy, while manufacturers of arms and weapon systems are deeply embedded in the highest levels of government. For these and other US monopolies, war is good for business, yet it does little good for the world. There's a reason why the United States only has about 60 to 70 billion total in trade volume with the whole African continent. It's because these companies are just taking from Africa. They are not investing. And so that's why they have problems when, for example, a country like China or even Russia begins to trade and cooperate with African countries more because they see that African countries may have an alternative to them. And so it is absolutely imperative for all sectors, from the energy, the massive energy monopoly in the United States, the military industrial complex, for Wall Street, all of these are, are massive monopolies that run on the most rapacious form of capitalism. Yet while US companies continue to profit from wars overseas, voices of opposition among the country's citizens have grown ever louder. We're here because this is the sixth and most destructive and terrorizing attack on Gaza in the last 16 years. In October 2003, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict erupted in a new round of violence. The long-running dispute quickly escalated to a level of ferocity rarely seen in recent years, resulting in a shocking death toll. The US has for years held a key role in efforts to broker long-lasting peace between Israel and Palestine. Yet in the wake of the violence, US President Joe Biden's promise of large-scale, unprecedented military aid for Israel led to intense scrutiny from the international community. Equally, US citizens rose en masse to call for their government to respond with words of peace rather than weapons of war. After all, it is their sons and daughters that the government sends onto the battlefields. I just don't like, glor like I said, I don't like glorifying uh, war because he died in a war. Our young people have no idea what they're signing up for because <laughs> they're signing up for lies. They're signing up a contract that's based on lies. They're signing a contract that the recruiter fully knows is going to be broken. The recruiter doesn't tell them about PTSD. The recruiter doesn't tell them that these benefits are going to be almost impossible to access when they get out of the military if they get Following out. her son's yeah. death, Cindy Sheenan became an active member in the anti-war movement. She regularly releases videos like this one online to expose the realities of military life. Yet her efforts are like a drop in the ocean compared with the resources of the US armed forces. At the peak of the Iraq war, the US had 170,000 troops deployed in the country. Carlos Labena was one of them. He was sent to Iraq in 2010. The reason I joined is for some adventures, to do something I didn't know if I wanted to go to college. I had no idea about myself, what I wanted to be in life. So I said, let me go serve my country for a little bit and now figure out from there. He was told he would be participating in a peace operation to maintain regional security. Um, when I was there, my mission was to protect the convoys and to make sure I was an infantryman, but we weren't doing any raids or accusations, so we just protected. I know it's a show of force to show the opposition how serious you are, but like I said, it should just be avoided at all costs, but at some occasions there, there is going to be military buildup and a show of force, and sometimes even an act of force and there's really nothing you can do to stop that. Um, my outlook at war afterwards, it should be avoided at all costs, but what can you do?
I wish there was no wars, but that seems to be impossible in this day and age. Recruiters promised Carlos that joining the military offered many advantages for a young person like him. Uh, once you serve your time in the military, you get 36 months of free college. And they also pay you to stay at, um, not to stay at home, but they pay for your rent while you go to school. So you don't have to worry about anything, pretty much, cost of living. Most veterans will have a GI Bill. Us being Americans, we have certain interests in other places that we have to make sure we have our foothold. And at times that causes military aggression. Is war truly inevitable? Or do some people simply make it appear inevitable? That war, as all wars, was built on lies. And they were thick and deep. UN inspectors in Iraq that said there's no weapons of mass destruction. I knew they were lies. We had people marching in the streets. 12 million people knew they were lies. We say don't bomb Iraq because war is not the will of God. War is never blessed by God. War is the ultimate mortal sin. There's no such thing as a just war. War cannot end terrorism because war is terrorism. War is not the way to God. If you agree, let me hear you. And Bush had said, that's enough. We have the evidence. Uh, we're bringing shock and awe to Iraq. So I was also there. After United States had been terrorized by 9-11, watching the United States of America terrorize another people. We will bring to the Iraqi people food and medicines and supplies and freedom. Yet, what most saw was only death and destruction. This was driven by religious extremism. It was a country where they had worked very hard to modernize. The women were running things. They were not covered. It was a secular country. The United States destroyed a beautiful country and beautiful people and six million people are dead from that war on terror, including the war on Afghanistan. War consumes everyone and everything in its path, but not all wounds are visible. Personal mental health issues and stuff have held me back, but it's just learning how to overcome these things that you have to learn at one point in life and then learn to forget about at another point. It's a sense of always being nervous, always looking over my shoulder, just not being comfortable, um, constantly thinking something's gonna go wrong. Uh, insomnia comes with it. In a war, opponents are dehumanized, yet the intensity of conflict can provoke in some people a powerful and dangerous reaction. First and foremost, the line between the victim and the victimizer is razor thin, uh, that we all have the capacity to be the oppressor under the right circumstances. I learned that violence is intoxicating. I've seen people when they kill in orgies of violence, it's as if they're drunk or high. Um, I learned that war gives meaning to empty lives. I've learned that war is addictive, not just to soldiers, and that's something that I, as a longtime war correspondent, had to struggle with because you don't fit in anymore to the world not at war. Uh, and yet the world at war is a very unhealthy, sick environment. Yet you keep wanting to go back to it. I, I, I didn't, I never done drugs, but I think it's similar to a drug addict, that at least you're back in an environment where uh, other people understand and share your very dark pathology. A few 
hours ago, I spoke with Iraqi Prime Minister Maliki. I reaffirmed that the United States keeps its commitments. So, today, I can report that, as promised, the rest of our troops in Iraq will come home by the end of the year. After nearly nine years, America's war in Iraq will be over. After years of public pressure in 2011, the U.S. government agreed to a full withdrawal of its troops from Iraq. The war would finally be over. It had cost the U.S. more than 750 billion U.S. dollars. Over 4,000 U.S. soldiers have been sacrificed and tens of thousands more have been left with life-changing injuries. It is impossible to truly know how many Iraqi civilians lost their lives in the fighting or from the political and economic chaos that followed. There's only one way to engage in social change and promote a fairer society, and that is by building real relationships with the oppressed. The oppressed cannot be an abstraction to you. History has an unsettling way of repeating itself. <laughs> But is it possible to halt the march of this war machine? I think within the United States, we have no control over the war industry. It, it is a state within a state. It can't even be audited. For some, war brings massive financial gain. They trade humanity for profit. And there is little sign of this changing anytime soon. And the United States and our allies and partners are moving as fast as possible to continue to provide Ukraine the forces that they need, the weapons they need, excuse me, the equipment they need. Their forces need to defend their nation. They are destroying Ukraine and having poor Ukrainian young men die, not for Ukraine, of course, uh, but to degrade the Russian military. It's like all proxy wars, is very cynical, and to isolate Putin uh, within Europe. Uh, uh, that's, that's Ukraine. We've now sanctioned Russian banks that together hold around $1 trillion in assets. Every asset they have in America will be frozen. Two major problems. The first is the Israel lobby, which is very powerful. The second is the arms industry. So Israel gets $3 billion a year in uh, U.S military aid. But remember, most of that money, or a lot of it, goes right back into the arms manufacturers. Even with Ukraine. That doesn't, money doesn't actually go to Ukraine. It goes to Northrop Grumman and Raytheon and all these companies that make the weapons systems. So they have a vested in, interest in perpetuating armed conflict. In 2023, the United States spent 62% of its 1.8 trillion US dollars federal discretionary spending on military programs. The massive federal budget spent on propping up war is robbing Americans of their future. I mean, we spend more on our military than what the next 10 or 11 countries combined, including Russia and China. War is very profitable. The United States economy now is heavily dependent on military contractors, weapons manufacturing. There's a huge gun crisis in the United States, but that is really fueled by the fact that US military contractors are making weapons in the tens of billions, hundreds of billions to ship abroad in order to wage conflict. So these two things are intertwined. What happens when money becomes more important than human suffering? Why can't we resolve our differences by talking? Why do we have to do escalating to war? And then what we're seeing, especially here in the United States, is this is all profit driven. I'm not, a, I'm not a black person. I'm not a white person. I'm not a brown person. I'm not an ethnicity. 
I'm a human being. I don't want to see a bunch of human beings die. I don't want to see a bunch of human beings suffer. I don't care. I don't care what religion. Everybody is God. Uh, everybody is God a creation. And everybody deserves human rights. There's huge feelings of war fatigue when it comes to U.S. wars because U.S. recruitment is down. People don't want to fight abroad. They don't want to lose their lives. And they also don't believe in the messaging, which I focus a lot on now because I think we need to still highlight the fact that the United States tries to present wars as ventures for democracy and liberty and freedom. No matter the message from any side of the war debate, history tells its own story. There was a time when I was quite young, uh, and one of our teachers showed us a film called Night and Fog. Filmmakers had gone into concentration camps, into the places where so many millions of Jewish people and others had been persecuted, starved, tortured, killed. The French filmmakers filmed what remained, and they showed the blankets that had been made out of human hair taken from the corpses. They showed lampshades that had been made out of human skin. And I said to myself, I never, never want to be somebody who is on the sidelines, who watches some terrible evil unfold and doesn't try to put a stop to it. Kathy Kelly is an American peace activist and writer. As a child, she witnessed the rebuilding of peace following World War II but later grew frustrated with the devastation wrought by US military campaigns overseas. She has traveled to Iraq 26 times, including during both the first Gulf War and the Iraq War. I can tell you that um, when I was in college, the Vietnam War was going on. I never passed out a leaflet. I never made a phone call. I never went to a demonstration. I, I would read the newspaper and I would weep. Uh, so I, I, I was very late in becoming involved, but finally I, I moved to one of the poorest neighborhoods in Chicago. And there I met some of the finest people in the world. And these were people who were very serious about aligning their lives to match what their deepest values were. And so I felt like that was my chance to um, take seriously what I had always deeply, deeply believed, thou shalt not kill. Kathy has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times. She has spent most of her life calling for peace, yet she feels her country has increasingly been heading in the opposite direction. So I think that if the United States doesn't take the lead ending its imperialism, then there's no world peace. We do not want our resources to be directed toward developing, selling, storing, using more and more weapons. My life is about stopping this monstrous regime that is the United States of America that thinks it's okay to murder people. It was okay for 500,000 children to die in Iraq with our sanctions that was called permissible collateral damage. Those are, that's monsters. That's what a monster does. So, of course, with the rise of China as an economic powerhouse and the decline of the United States in terms of its economic uh, strength, uh, you, there is again that kind of desperate effort to use the military to regain what can't be regained. That is, a, is characteristic of late empires.
In this modern and interconnected age, a question we must all face is, how can we make the world a better place? Even a stone thrown in the sea causes a ripple. This is a, a family whose mother, Karima, was a widow. And Karima uh, was away from the house much of the time. Her oldest daughter, Fatima, took care of these younger children. And they were just a delight to be with. Um, When I was in Afghanistan, um, young girls would literally take me by the hand and lead me up a mountainside. And closer to the uh, higher portions of that mountain, and most of the people living there were either widows or single mother, mothers, and they, they really didn't have a way to feed their children. Uh, sometimes they sent their children down into the marketplace to pick up scraps from the market. I saw parents who would, you know, flinch when they heard a bomb explode, but then kind of put on a poker face. You, you could see them trying to make sure that they didn't frighten the children. Uh, I have certainly seen people who were medical people in war zones persist even though they felt abandoned and alone and almost couldn't believe what was happening to them. Her travels through war zones have given Kathy a deeper understanding of the meaning of perseverance. I think that when we begin to understand uh, what happens when people are displaced by wars. It helps us feel more fuel, in a sense, for trying to oppose the machinery of war, trying to oppose the likelihood of um, going into a new war. And even after a war ends, the nightmares do not. Following her son's death in Iraq, Cindy was initially reluctant to place a headstone on his grave. She calls the cemetery where he is laid to rest, Casey's Park. The reality is too painful. Cindy visits here every day to place fresh flowers on her son's grave and write in her diary. She sometimes lays down to sleep, to dream of her son, who she feels died for nothing. Why does Casey need a gravestone? Why was he killed in, in this war that was based on lies and, and just so other people could get rich and prosper? You know, and millions of people are dead because of this. I mean, war is about death. It is the cult of death. It is a celebration of death. Everything about war is about crushing all of those forces that nurture life, familial, social, artistic, political, cultural, everything. We want love, not hatred. Uh, we don't want to use our eyes to perceive people because they're a different color or they have a different facial structure. Uh, we want to see them as human beings and listen to what they have to say. And as long as we can say we are sane, we can be human and we can be humane. Across the planet, we share a connection that runs broad and deep. We are separated only by our imaginations. Time and again, we come together in times of natural disasters and in coping with changes to the global environment. The fate of humanity is in our hands. When Casey was killed, all those flags were 
in the United States to honor people, they put the flags halfway down. Our Casey, ever faithful, kind and gentle, good son, beloved brother, brave soldier, dear friend, You loved your family and lived your life serving others till the end. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger. I'm traveling through this world of woe. There is no sickness, no toil, no danger in that bright world to which I go. I'm going home to see my father. I'm going there, no more to wrong. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only going over home. I know dark clouds may gather around me. I know my way is rough and steep, but golden fields lie out before me, where God's redeemed shall live sleep. I'm going home. And when I went over to where she sat, there were tears streaming down her face. And then I realized she was thinking about her brothers and her family members. She couldn't find out had they survived. And that, once we find peace all together in terms of inhabiting this, this world, then we will have peace and not war. Letter to Barbara Bush. I am the mother of a son killed in Iraq. You are the mother of the man who killed him. We can quantify PTSD with soldiers, but the health of an entire society, it's hard to quantify. The most important element to peace and conflict resolution is to dismantle the international arms industry, of which the United States is a major uh, supplier of weapons, flooding countries with weapons, inevitably, especially in fragile societies. And, and we said the world does not want war. 